Welcome to the Folktale Project, this is Dan Scholes. And we're going to pick up where we left off with the second tale. We've heard all about the cattle lifting, and now it's time to go to the robber's cave. Then, these high matters being finished, the Highlander retired with Bailey MacWeeble, doubtless to arrange with him concerning the arrears of blackmail. But of that, the Baron was supposed to know nothing. This done, the Highlander began to ask all about the party which had driven off the cattle, their appearance, whence they had come, and in what place they had last been seen. Edward was very much interested by the man's shrewd questions and the quickness with which he arrived at his conclusions. Well, on his part, Evan Dew was so flattered by the evident interest of the young Englishman that he invited him to take a walk with him into the mountains in search of the cattle promising him that if the matter turned out as he expected, he would take Edward to such a place as he had never seen before, and might never have a chance of seeing again. Waverley accepted with eager joy, and though Rose Bradwardine turned pale at the idea, the Baron, who loved boldness in the young, encouraged the adventure. He gave Edward a young gamekeeper to carry his pack and to be his attendant so that he might make the journey with fitting dignity. Through a great pass full of rugged rocks and seamed with roaring torrents, indeed the very pass of Ballybow in which the revivers had last been spied, across weary and dangerous morasses, where Edward had perforce to spring from tuft to tussock of coarse grass, Evan Dew led our hero into the depths of the wild highland country, where no Saxon foot trod, or dared to tread, without the leave of Vic Ian Vore, as the chief's foster brother took occasion to inform Edward more than once. By this time the night was coming on, and Edward's attendant was sent off with one of Evan Dew's men that they might find a place to sleep in, while Evan himself pushed forward to warn the supposed cattle-stealer, one Donald Bean Lean, of the party's near approach. For, as Evan Dew said, the Cateran might very naturally be startled by the sudden appearance of Silderoy, or a red soldier, in the very place of his most secret retreat. Edward was thus left alone with the single remaining Highlander, from whom, however, he could obtain no further information as to his journey's end, save that, as the Sassenach was somewhat tired, Donald Bean might possibly send the Curragh for him. Edward wished much to know whether the Curragh was a horse, a cart, or a chaise, but in spite of all his efforts he could get no more out of the man with the Lockbar axe than the words repeated over and over again. Ach, ay, Takarak. Ach, ay, Takarak. However, after stumbling on a little farther, they came out on the shores of a loch, and the guide, pointing through the darkness in the direction of a little spark of light far away across the water, said, Yon's the cove. Almost at the same moment, the dash of oars was heard, and a shrill whistle came to their ears out of the darkness. This, the Highlander answered and a boat appeared in which Edward was soon seated and on his way to the robber's cave. The light, which at first had been no bigger than a rushlight, grew rapidly larger, glowing red, as it seemed, upon the very bosom of the lake. Cliffs began to rise above their heads, hiding the moon. And, as the boat rapidly advanced, Edward could make out a great fire kindled on the shore into which the dark, mysterious figures were busy flinging pine branches. The fire had been built on a narrow ledge at the opening of a great black cavern into which an inlet of the loch seemed to advance. The men rowed straight for this black entrance, then, letting the boat run on with shipped oars, the fire was soon passed and left behind, and the cavern entered through a great rocky arch. At the foot of some natural steps, the boat stopped. The beacon brands which had served to guide them were thrown hissing into the water, and Edward found himself lifted out of the boat by brawny arms and carried almost bodily into the depths of the cavern. Presently, however, he was allowed to walk, though still guided on either side, when suddenly at a turn of the rock passage the cave opened out, and Edward found the famous Cateran, Donald Bean Lean, with his whole establishment plain before his eyes. The cavern was lit with pine torches, and a charcoal fire five or six highlanders were seated about, while in the dusk behind several others slumbered wrapped in their plaids. In a large recess to one side were seen the carcasses of both sheep and cattle, hung by the heels as in a butcher's shop. Some of them, 
all too evidently the spoils of the Baron of Bradwardine's flocks and herds. The master of this strange dwelling came forward to welcome Edward, while Evan Dew stood by his side to make the necessary introductions. Edward had expected to meet with a huge, savage warrior in the captain of such banditti, but to his surprise he found Donald Bean Lean to be a little man, pale and insignificant in appearance, and not even highland in dress. For at one time Donald had served in the French army. So now, instead of receiving Edward in his national costume, he had put on an old blue and red foreign uniform in which he made so strange a figure that, though it was donned in his honor, his visitor had hard work to keep from laughing. Nor was the freebooter's conversation more in accord with his surroundings. He talked much of Edward's family and connections, and especially of his uncle's Jacobite politics, on which last account he seemed inclined to welcome the young man with more cordiality than as a soldier of King George, Edward felt to be his due. The scene which followed was, however, better fitted to the time and place. At a half-savage feast, Edward had the opportunity of tasting steaks, fresh cut from the baron's castle, broiled on the coals before his eyes and washed down with draughts of highland whiskey. Yet, in spite of the warmth of his welcome, there was something very secret and unpleasant about the shifty, cunning glance of this robber-thief who seemed to know so much about the royal garrisons, and even about the men of Edward's own troop, whom he had brought with him from Waverley Honour. When at last they were left alone together, Evan Dew having lain down his plaid, the little captain of cattle lifters asked Captain Waverley, in a very significant manner, if he had nothing particular to say to him. Edward, a little startled at the tone in which the question was put, answered that he had no other reason for coming to the cave but a desire to see so strange a dwelling place. For a moment, Donald Bean Lean looked at him full in the face, as if waiting for something more, and then, with a nod full of meaning, he muttered, You might as well have confided in me. I am as worthy of trust as either the Baron of Bradwardine or Vicky and Vore, but you are equally welcome to my house. His heather bed, the flickering of the fire, the smoking torches, and the movement of the wild outlaws going and coming out of the cave soon, however, diverted Waverley's thoughts from the mysterious words of his host. His eyelids drew together, nor did he reopen them till the morning sun reflected from the lake was filling all the cave with a glimmering twilight. And that is our final tale for this week, The Robber's Cave. We'll come back on Monday with three new tales from this retelling of Waverly, beginning with a second interlude of action on Monday. This is Dan Schultz for The Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, anywhere you like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com, where you'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. As always, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>